I didn't bother to screw up. We got it working. Oh, okay. I was just, I, I got my iPad and I was going to use that. Okay. Well, I think we got it. Good morning. Welcome to Parkway United Church of Christ. I am just stalling for a moment to see if we are actually on Facebook Live. I'm not getting 12 texts, so I think we must be. I ran back for my iPad because something was not going well, but I, apparently it is. Another, another tech miracle. So thank you for choosing to be with us in person or virtually or watching us later in the day. We have been inviting you the last couple of Sundays to consider coloring a peace dove as we continue to think about our siblings in Ukraine and in Russia and in other places in the world where there is tumult and unrest and people at each other. And so you might want to take one of those pieces of paper home, or you might ask us and we'll email you one or mail you one. I color and post it somewhere where you can see it, uh, where others can see it, so we can be more aware of the dream and the vision and the prayers for peace. Do that anytime you want during the service. We continue to move through our United Church of Christ to bring some release and relief to people who are finding themselves as new refugees escaping from Ukraine, either staying there or going to other countries. Uh, there's a particular focus in our United Church of Christ on women and children because many women and children are leaving their partners, leaving their husbands, leaving their fathers in Ukraine because the men are unable to get out. And so we're paying particular attention to women and children, especially in settings where women and children don't always have full rights and uh, freedom of movement. And so our denomination is paying particular attention to women and children, to their needs, so that they can have safe passage, so that they can have all of the things that they need. So know that through our denomination, you can support uh, women and children. Our meditation this morning at the top of your bulletin says, May the touch of your skin register the beauty of the otherness that surrounds you. And when you partake of food and drink, may your taste quicken to the gift and sweetness that flows from the earth. And so this is a communion Sunday, and we have an open table, and we invite you to receive this sacrament this taste of sweetness, this gift, this connection with the holy. We have our pew pads in your rows again. They just returned last week. If you would like to make your presence known, if you have a question or a concern or a need or an idea, you're more than welcome to jot that down the pew pad as well. Make yourself known in the chat on Facebook um, or in other ways let us know that you are with us. We've been talking about how we can connect with each other since we are not passing the peace in traditional ways that we have done. Since Ramadan just began, and since we continue to be in deep relationship with the Afghan family we are sponsoring and welcoming with Sharameth and Taysom, we have learned from our Afghan friends that one of the ways that they offer a blessing to each other is to put their hand over their heart and to nod to the person. And so we're gonna try different things um, in the next couple of months and we invite you as we pass the peace of Christ to try an Afghan way uh, in this season of Ramadan of focusing more on how we can be more faithful, 
within our communities and with the larger human community. And so we invite you to feel the love of God, to feel the peace of Christ, to feel the movements of the Holy Spirit binding us together. And we offer you a gift of peace. We invite you to sing with us our welcome song, verses two and three of Gather Us In. Good morning. Good morning. Our first scripture reading is Mark 9, 35 through 37, from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus sat down, called the twelve disciples, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. 
Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. We invite you to please rise if you're comfortable doing so and join us in our call to worship. Waiting for the Touch of God by Ruth Sandberg. I've got a life meant for living. I've got hands meant for serving. I've got a mind that needs direction. I've got a heart meant for loving. I've got feet meant for dancing. I've got wounds that need healing. We come waiting for the touch of God. We come to receive blessings. We come to learn afresh how to be a blessing to others. Worship our God together, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. During this season of Lent, we have gathered at these Lenten candles, and each time we have worshipped, we have extinguished one of the candles. Remembering the darkness that is a part of Lent and Holy Week, but recognizing that part of our job is to keep that flame of love and hope alive. And so on Easter morning, we will light all of the candles again and keep them lit through the whole service. We are thinking about Jesus, what he does, what he did, who he is, and how we can be more like him. And so week after week, we've been thinking about some of those things that are part of his identity and part of who we can be as Christians, ones who follow in Christ's way. We talked about our power and our ability to choose and have agency when he was in the wilderness. We talked about love and empathy and how he came alongside of people, how he separated himself from time to time, from the crowds and the needs of the people so that he could be refreshed and restored in his life with God. We heard his stories that he told, little stories that people could remember that were filled with truth and guidance and encouragement. And we talked about how our stories are woven together with the stories of others. And today we're thinking about touch and how Jesus used touch, how people touched Jesus, how we can assure one another and ground one another when we use meaningful, appropriate touch. Please join us in our opening prayer. Holy One, as we make this Lenten journey, we see what Jesus does in order that we might do similar things. We can. We sense his power and we can exercise our own agency and make choices. We feel his empathy and we can bring more love into the world. We see him spend time apart from everything else and we can take time to step away and be still. We listen to his stories and can weave our stories together with people near and far. We watch him touch people and we can release our reassurance to others. We hear him speak up, and we can be bold for ourselves and others. 
we sense his struggles and we can find our own courage and stamina. We receive his peace and we can become calm amid storms of every kind. Amen. Please be seated. Some weeks seem very long, and I really am having a hard time remembering if it was last Sunday, just last Sunday, that I was talking about soccer and basketball. I think it was, but it's been a really long week. Anybody else had a really long week? Well, I did get in a little bit of trouble from some people who said, um, what about baseball? This is a baseball town, and so I was sure to make sure that I brought that with me because what I want to talk about today a little bit is how we protect our bodies, how we keep ourselves safe. And sometimes we put on a baseball, well, well yeah. visors, they, these don't work for me anymore. But I know some of you have hats like these, right? Are these kind of the hats that you wear around here? No, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. When you're out riding your bike or on a scooter, you want to make sure that you have a helmet. How many of you have helmets? Good. And in the winter time, you want to make sure that you have a hat that keeps your head warm. And if you can get it down over your ears, that's really good too. We've been wearing a lot of masks. Sometimes it's good to wear a mask that says vote. This Tuesday, vote, vote, vote. If you want to know who to vote for, what to vote for, ask me. I'm happy to tell you. Peace. Peace. We've seen a lot of masks. Sometimes band-aids protect us or bug spray or sunblock. These things that maybe are going to be happening again. Hand sanitizer and oven mitt. There are so many things that we have that can protect us. And God asks us to protect each other too, to take care of each other, to keep each other safe, to remind each other about some of these things and to care for each other using our words, using our actions, the things that we do and the things that we decide not to do because it wouldn't be safe, it wouldn't be healthy, it wouldn't be protecting someone to do and say some of the things that we think maybe we want to do. Please pray with us. God, we thank you again for this season of spring and all of the things that we will be doing outside as the weather gets warmer and warmer. We thank you, as we did last Sunday, for basketball and soccer, and we say today, go Cards, as the baseball season opens this week. God, help us to be at play and help us to take care of each other, to protect each other, to keep each other safe with the things that we do and the things that we say. Because we feel your love, we want to share your love with others. Help us, O oh God, to do that every day. Amen.
Most of you have heard of Lydia's House, a United Church of Christ agency that provides shelter for abused women and children. Not the 90-day emergency care our city provides, but two years of housing and help to get women and children out of an abusive relationship. It's the largest in the Midwest. However, you may not have heard how it got started. In 1993, there was a group of about 15 women who were meeting for meditation and song in their homes. Four of these women, all UCC, reached a point where they wanted to do some mission work. They decided to try to provide two years of housing, counseling, help with getting a GED if necessary, and finding a job. They would buy a two-family flat in South St. Louis. Thanks to a man who worked for Southern Commercial Bank on South Grand, they got a loan. He eventually served on the board. The first floor would be office space and housing for the first director and her partner. The second floor would house two abused women. They laughed at themselves when it dawned on them that maybe some of the women would be bringing children. They chose the name Lydia's House after Lydia in the Book of Acts, a seller of purple who had opened her home to the disciples. Then the four women began speaking in every UCC church, other churches, women's groups, men's groups, any groups that would invite them. They received grants from the state of Missouri. And by the way, Missouri is pretty good about giving them grant money. People started to volunteer. My husband cut grass. Then someone donated a two-family flat. The staff expanded. St. Paul's UCC gave them office space, asking only for utility expenses. This gave them private meeting space that was away from where the women lived. Next, they bought a 12-family apartment. They sold Lydia's house pins that many of you bought years ago. That brought in about 25,000 a year. In 2002, maybe some of you remember, Parkway had a Mardi Gras party and raised several thousand dollars. In 2001, I was asked to serve on the board. Like other board members, I attended lectures at Wash U on domestic violence. The response and support for Lydia's house grew and grew. We were amazed how many young people were responding. And many people who had experienced abuse in their family also responded. And then the board decided to expand housing again. We looked and looked and looked for more housing in 2004. Then truly, like a gift from God, we found something we never thought or prayed for. There were 10 four-family apartments for sale on the same dead-end street with room for a playground. God is good. Lydia House now shelters an average of 45 women and 75 children with an 87% success rate. One in four women in our country will suffer domestic violence at some point in her life. Every day, three women are murdered by their intimate partners. Children who grow up in an abusive home will suffer greatly. It will strongly affect how they act growing up and how they relate to people as adults. The cycle has to stop. There are several kinds of violence, physical, sexual, verbal, psychological, and economic. Let me close with two stories. About three years ago, Pam Manning and I, um, who also served on the board, just went down to help serve a Thanksgiving meal to the women and children. 
the director, Karen Kirk, came over to us and said, see that woman sitting over there with a little four-year-old girl with red hair? She hasn't been out with a group of women for fun in over two years. I think she's doing okay, but we'll keep an eye on her. And here's another story. I met my husband when I was 21. I felt sure he was the one. But once we were married, he began isolating me from friends, monitoring my calls, and telling me who I could talk to. It was always just the two of us. I felt so alone, and so I ended up drawing closer to him. One night when he was working late, I decided to meet a friend for dinner. My husband was so angry that he threw me against a wall. He later apologized and said he loved me, so I believed it wouldn't happen again until it started happening daily. After four broken ribs and a broken jaw, I feared for my life. I had no job, no money, and no place to go. I was referred to Lydia's house by a local shelter I found through the ER. When I moved to Lydia's house, it was my saving grace. I found friendship through staff and other members, women I met at the support groups, and I didn't feel alone. I am now living on my own, financially independent, and finishing my college degree. Anna. Thank you for your continuing support for Lydia's House, a place of healing and a voice of hope. I have left some brochures out in the gathering space if you want to read more about Lydia's House. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. We want to make sure that if you are being mistreated, or if you know someone who is, that you try to say something about it. Try to tell someone who you trust. Let me know, and we can see if we can find a way out of what often seems impossible to get out of. So thank you again, Florence, for that. Our second mile collections will be split evenly amongst these four mission partners, Heifer Project, Lydia's House, Up, Unleashing Potential, and Eden Seminary. If you have a gift, clearly mark it so that it is separated, so that at the end of the season, these agencies who know how to serve can do so with our blessing and our encouragement. We are always eager to be partnered with you as we worship, as we serve, as we build community here, as we encourage you to be more faithful with all of the things that you say and do out in the world. As we continue to think about our sense of belonging, as we think about hospitality and generosity, we receive our offering.
Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Holy One, we are eager to be useful, helping along your vision of a just and caring world. Heighten our sense that we can be more aware of your presence and the ways you are guiding us to be more loving to one another. Shape us into your grace. Amen. Please be seated. This scripture reading is Mark 5, 25 through 34 from the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, yet she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Our next scripture reading is John 9, 1 through 11, and again from the New Revised Standard Version. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eye, saying to him, Go wash in the, po in the pool of Shalom, which means sent. 
Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors of those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said, Go to the Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. May God help us to find truth, guidance, and comfort in these words. I have been your hands. And for that, I am grateful. I go on your behalf, and I hold people's hands. I would be out there now holding whoever that is. <laughs> I hold hands in nursing homes and in hospitals and in hospice centers because I'm an extension of you and the church. I deliver prayer blankets that we have passed around the sanctuary. You have tied knots on those prayer blankets. I get to deliver those blankets to people on your behalf, and I carry with me your blessing and your encouragement, your power, your sweetness, and your peace. Sometimes I get to go to the hospital and hold a baby that's just hours old because you have entrusted me to do that on your behalf. And at baptisms, I get to hold even the squirrely ones, sometimes chase one around up here. I get to hold wedding rings right before they are exchanged and placed on the other person's hand. And at the table at the funeral home, I get to hold a hand, and here in this sanctuary, or just afterwards, I get to hold hands with people who are walking the difficult path of grief. It's an awesome responsibility and privilege that I get to touch people on your behalf. Thank you for allowing me to be your hand. So I couldn't think of a really good transition for right now, and I'll just tell you that when I was a kid, I wanted a pet monkey. It was my favorite animal in the zoo, and it still is. Whenever my kids were little and we went to the zoo, I would drag them, maybe a little bit sounding like that, because I had to see the monkeys. I loved how playful they were and how they took care of each other, how they groomed each other, how they were community one with another. In fact, I called our kids monkey, which was never a problem until our fourth child came along, and then I got in trouble for that from time to time. And I don't know if you are ever on Instagram, but you know they watch you, right? They track you, and so you start to see more and more of the things that you like. So if I opened my Instagram, I'd show you all these little monkey videos because I just love to see them, but sometimes they're heartbreaking. Have you seen those little monkey videos where the parents just you can't believe the discipline they lay on the baby monkeys, the teeny little ones. I was in middle school when I first learned about the cloth monkey study. Many of you know that, Harry Harlow's experiment, where they tried to figure out what would happen 
to a baby monkey if it was denied the maternal connection, if it was separated from its family. And they learned a lot of things. And that was a long time ago. And I wish we could take some of this science that we learn and put it into use over and over again. I wish we could get better at it. If you don't know the cloth monkey stories, I hope that you will look it up, but it's all about connection and touch. And these babies that were denied their mothers would cling to the cloth diapers that they had on because they needed something soft. They needed something that they could turn toward. They needed something that they could touch and they could feel so that they knew that they weren't alone. I wish we could find those kids who aren't getting the touch that they need. When we were going through our foster and adoption classes, we were told that there were no babies available. If you're here in this class to get a baby, you may as well leave because there are no babies available. We said we want to get in the back of the line because we have had three babies and we want someone else who has that in their heart to be able to do that. They told us unfortunately, that the reason there are not a lot of babies that come into care, into foster care, is because babies that are mistreated aren't noticed until they get a little bit older. And people can see them in the hallway or in the neighborhood or at school. And so that is a major reason why there aren't a lot of babies in foster care or available for adoption. The pandemic has taught us a lot of things, and one of them is an old lesson, not just from the cloth monkey study, but from generation after generation, that we need each other. We're not self-sufficient. We have to touch each other and hold each other. None of us was created ready to go, ready to take care of ourselves. And pretty rarely do we find ourselves in long stretches of time when we don't need someone else to care for us, to encourage us, to see us, to touch us, to hold us, to allow us to know that we exist, that we matter, that we are cherished. A few days ago, it was Transgender Day of Visibility, and we say we see you, and we honor you, and we cherish you as you figure out who you are, and how you fit, and how you are loved and included. We've been dog-sitting this week. That might be why it's felt like a really long week, because we have our own pets. And Pepper, who lives next door to us, has this incredible whine that says, you have to touch me. You have to play with me. You can't ignore me because I see you and I need you. Dexter and I, our 16-year-old, are watching a couple of shows, and no spoilers, but there are some scenes where I'm like, just touch them. Just reach across that chasm. Reach across that brokenness and touch that person. They're crying out for that. Maybe you've seen on college campuses where parents go and they wear shirts or they hold signs that say dad hugs or mom hugs and they're especially available during finals time or when people on campus are trying to figure out how they fit and who they are and if they matter and people go to make themselves available to strangers and just say i'm here i see you i want to remind you physically that you exist. We lay on hands at ordinations, and maybe you've been at an ordination where everyone in the congregation connects to each other, even if they're still in the pews, and that energy, that spirit, that strength and stamina, sweetness, gets translated to the person and makes its way around the church. April 2nd, yesterday was World Autism Awareness Day, and it's another piece of the puzzle. We have to try to figure out what does touch do to people? 
because there are people who love it, thrive on the touch, and there are some people that just as well be in their own personal private space. That's another thing that we learned during the pandemic, not just that people need touch, but that people are in charge of how they are touched. And so as we get back into connecting with each other, I hope that you are asking people and not just assuming that people want to touch in the ways that they have before that maybe never were comfortable for them. The quote from the beginning of the bulletin from John O'Donohue talks about registering on our skin the beauty of otherness, so knowing that there is something outside of us and knowing that connection. And because that quote was there, someone sent me another quote by him. You do that sometimes, and I appreciate that. And this one was about the invisible embrace by John O'Donohue. And it says, the dead are not distant or absent. They are alongside us. When we lose someone to death, we lose their physical image and presence. They slip out of physical, physical form into invisible presence. This alteration of form is the reason we cannot see the dead, but because we do not see them does not mean that they are not there. And so we can even touch beyond time and space. And so here's something that you were hoping I was not going to talk about, and that's the Oscars from last Sunday. Some of you were already thinking that in your mind, maybe, about touch appropriate and inappropriate touch, but what I want to talk about is not that, but I want to talk about the best actress category. Tammy Faye Baker, some of you maybe saw The Eyes of Tammy Faye. I was dragged to that movie. I didn't want to see it, but I was wrong on many levels. But the one that sticks with me today is that story, and maybe you remember when it happened in real time, or maybe you remember it from the film, when Tammy Faye said, how sad that we, as Christians, who are to be salt of the earth, we who are supposed to be able to love everyone, are afraid so badly of an AIDS patient that we will not go up and put our arm around them and tell them that we care. She said that, tearfully, makeup pouring down her face on a live interview. And maybe your mind goes where mine goes next about Princess Diana visiting that Harlem hospital and embracing that seven-year-old with AIDS. Touch can be dangerous. Touch can be healing. Touch can be refreshing. Touch can be the only thing that makes a difference. On Friday, the Pope said that he felt sorrow and shame. He apologized on behalf of the church, having that responsibility, that privilege of speaking for the church. He apologized for the Catholic Church's role in the abuse of indigenous children in Canada. It's important for us to know when Touch is abuse. And that's why Lydia's house is one of our second mile offering partners this season. And so we want to commission you today. As we have been thinking about Jesus does, how about you? We invite you to think about how you touch and how you are touched how important it is to be focused on meaningful touch, appropriate touch, consensual touch. But trying to sort through that can be challenging. And so we invite you to pay attention to this piece of Jesus's ministry, the bodily touch ministry, and see how you fit in that, how you are guided, corrected, challenged, delighted as you share in that bodily presence of the spirit and love of God. As we move to our communion table, it's because Jesus knew that we needed to touch and to taste and to feel and to feel our body and to know the spirit moving through it. We invite you to our open table because we don't know what the holy will do 
And so we don't try to manage it. We don't try to push people away. We just set a table and we invite you to think about how you have been invited, how you are known, your broken pieces, your strengths, your past, your future. You are known and you are invited to be in this place at the table, knowing that God wants to be in it with you and the Holy wants to move through you. As we continue to move forward um, in relaxing some of our COVID protocols, we do have ushers that will pass the communion trays, but we continue to have the prepackaged communion elements there for you. If you would prefer not to have that passed across where you are, there are some up here at the table, or I can bring one to you. We are invited, each of us, to be nurtured and encouraged, to be touched, to be blessed, to become a blessing to others. Please sing with us our communion song, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. It's us watching Jesus, learning from him, and then doing the things that he does. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. As we move into our time of prayer together, we invite you to carry a few things from this last week, the Transgender Day of Visibility, the end of Women's History Month, Autism Day. We're thinking about Mike and Jerry Rogers as Mike is now retired, Gladys Sims and family as they prepare to celebrate Russ's life, a memorial service on the 16th of this month, and the family and friends of Conrad Damsgaard, as we grieve and give thanks for him, the date of his visitation and memorial service has changed, as opposed to next weekend that we originally announced, it will be on Sunday the 24th of April. Joan Beast had her port implanted and began chemotherapy this week. 
Sharon Eisler is struggling with several health concerns. Jerry is hospitalized with breathing and heart issues. We continue to think about the war in Ukraine. As we gather at this table, we invite you to pray with us. Holy One, as we gather around this table, we do so like we do every other table. And if there are people at it with us, we look into each other's eyes, we tell our stories, we ask our questions, we laugh and cry and learn and grow. We lean on each other, we challenge each other, we listen for the ways that your spirit weaves us together. And so now we come with celebration and concern, with hungers and thirsts, and with resources and gifts immeasurable. And so God, hear us now as we come to this place together, as we pray aloud or silently about those things that we cannot hold because of the great joy and the things that seem to grip us and won't leave us alone the pain and the questions, the concerns that we have. Holy One, hear us as we pray. And because Jesus knew that sometimes all we need to do is pray and things will begin to release and will begin to encourage and inspire paths will begin to open we sing together the prayer that Jesus taught It was on that night that Jesus was gathered with the disciples. They were celebrating the Passover. They were remembering together how God did not leave them alone, but that God was in the midst of challenge and burden with them, and God gave them a way out of no way. Jesus knew what was happening in the city and happening within the disciples in their minds, their bodies, their spirits, their relationships. And so he sought to ground them and to touch them and to bring more spirit to them. And so he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it saying, this is my body for you. And in the same manner, after they ate, he took the cup and he blessed it, gave thanks for it, poured it. Saying, this is the new covenant in my love, which is for you and for many, eat, drink, and remember. Ministering to you in his name, we offer you a taste, a touch, an aroma of God's love.
If you're comfortable doing so, we invite you to please rise and join us in our prayer of thanksgiving. We are grateful, generous God, for your invitation to this simple, sacred meal. You always set a place for us. May the nurture of Christ's presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the encouragement of this community move us forward to be your hands, heart, and hope today and tomorrow. Amen. And now may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the comfort and reassurances of the Holy Spirit be with you. And may they move through you to others, especially that person that has forgotten or has gotten lost or is afraid. Go with love, go with peace, go with assurance. Amen. We invite you for a brief moment to have a seat as we offer some announcements. Thank you for choosing to be with us as we worship in our open and affirming congregation where we strive for limitless love, courageous action, and spirited inquiry. Our flowers today are from Jackie Eifert. An email went out yesterday about some opportunities, some possibilities for this coming week. We send a daily Lenten devotional and a few of you have submitted your own reflections and if you would like to do that, we are delighted to receive that. Our Tuesday afternoon dialogue, new book, is being worked over. They continue to meet this Tuesday on Zoom and would love for you to participate. Our Tuesday evening dialogue group starts their new book on Tuesday the 12th. That will be in person down the hall in the Heritage Room. They will go back to their tradition of starting with the potluck meal together as we continue to relax some of our protocols. We do hope that you continue to make yourself safe and keep in mind the vulnerabilities of others. We continue to support and encourage and learn from the Afghan family that we are sponsoring with our Jewish and Muslim neighbors. We continue to have a sign up genius out there if you would like to contribute to some of their needs for spring and summer. We will be having an iftar during Ramadan, so breaking the fast together as that interfaith circle with Taysom and Sharameth and our Afghan family. That will take place on Saturday, April 23rd, and we hope that when you see that invitation come through that you might sign up for it. Our adventurous women out late um, have not been out much the last couple years, but they have a new schedule and it includes a number of things and some of those need RSVPs, so look at that list. 
Uh, we were saved this morning by Kent and John. We almost were without connection at home, uh, but we continue to receive your gifts for our video project. We have raised all of the funds that we believe that we need, and so we're moving to get a portable system so that when we're across the street in the historic sanctuary, when we're outdoors, when we might be in other places on location, we have the ability to video live stream. We also are wanting to put something in the Heritage Room so that our speaker series and our Tuesday evening dialogue, etc., can be broadcast from there. Holy Week will begin next Sunday with Palm Sunday. We will have a speaker series that day. It's called In Search of Birds. Some of you have talked about how you have been appreciating the bird sounds this season. Read more about that in your bulletin. We will worship on Monday, Thursday in the sanctuary at 7. Good Friday opportunity is across the street in the historic sanctuary at noon, back over here at 7 p.m. We will have our Easter vigil from Good Friday, 8 p.m., through the sunrise service on Sunday morning. And we invite you to sign up to take one hour and to be in prayer carrying the faith community with you. That online sign up is available. If you prefer not to sign up online, you can see me and we'll make sure that you get signed up for one of those hours. 6.15 a.m. will be our sunrise service across the street in the cemetery and then worship here at 10 a.m. Your bulletin gives you information about Easter flowers and about our Easter egg hunt. You're never too old, really, for an Easter egg hunt, and so uh, see that information. Again, thank you for choosing to be with us, and now as we go from this place, we go to be the hands, the heart, the healing of God in the world. Amen. Mm -hmm.